afternoon. Uh, my name is Tarek Raha. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Syracuse University School of Architecture. Um, oh, my, title, my talk is entitled uh, Built Environment Technologies from Smart Buildings to Smart Cities. So first of all, thank you very much to Techni Summit for inviting me to be here and thanks a lot for hanging out. Uh, I know that we're getting into the middle of the day, so no, not everyone is very interested. So I'm, I'm going to try and deliver something that's of interest to you. So I finished my PhD at MIT, focusing on building technologies, and then started this new position at Syracuse University as assistant professor. And so I'm here to talk to you about the kind of research I'm attempting to lead and how this links to your daily lives uh, and the idea of looking at smart buildings and smart cities. So my research goal is to influence the practice of architecture and um, urban design um, uh, through the development of workflows that enable designers to understand the impact of their design decisions on many aspects of sustainability, such as human health and well-being, carbon emissions and energy efficiency, all in a performative design aspects. And basically, I'm focusing on three fields, um, modeling urban energy flows, um, daylighting and energy in buildings, as well as uh, generative design and optimization. And today I will be talking to you in around 15 minutes about these three fields. And then I hope that I would engage you in some questions. I typically, in a classroom, attempt to be very, um, uh, very inviting to engagement and, and questions. And so I'm leaving m my class at, at Syracuse and at hoping to, uh, to achieve the same thing today by getting you involved in the process. So we start first by the topic of modeling energy flows. So the idea is that cities are growing exponentially around the globe. So more human beings are living in cities than ever since 2008. Half of the human population is living in cities and we're becoming more urban than ever. And so as a building scientist and an architect, I joined the Sustainable Design Lab at MIT to develop tools to understand how energy flows in buildings. And this is a picture from UMI, which is a tool that we uh, uh, have developed at the Sustainable Design Lab. It's available to download at urbanmodeling.net. And we look at mapping energy performance, so in different aspects. So this is from the citywide energy study of Boston. This is part of the MIT campus looking at operational energy use, how energy is spent in buildings. But we're looking at different aspects, such as uh, daylighting in buildings, as well as embodied carbon, the energy that is put into building buildings. Uh, uh, but my particular focus is on sustainable mobility and aspects of outdoor thermal comfort. And I'm going to uh, introduce you to why I think sustainable mobility is, is important in our lives. So this is a picture from Cairo in the 1940s. I believe that we had a model for sustainable living and livability in general based on human scale design, as well as integration of public transportation with streetcars and trams, which were provisioned at the time, as well as provisioned here in Alexandria, as well as mixed use development. So having the ground floor always having activities where you can go and buy your daily things that you need or have uh, a drink at, or a coffee. But unfortunately, in Cairo, we reached a stage where it's actually very difficult to be living in a city where cars are the predominant um, creature on the streets. And so uh, this car-centric lifestyle has become very difficult for us to sustain. You can imagine that having a car and you, you're leading a, a car-centric lifestyle, automobile-centric lifestyle, would affect fossil fuels as well as carbon emissions, the use of fossil fuels and uh, carbon emissions, the human health where you're subjected to pollution as well as not exercising, you're not walking, you're not biking, so there is no aspects that make you exercise, as well as spend money in buying a car. It becomes a teenage dream to have your own car. So you, you ask your parents or you save some money and you invest in getting a car, as well as creating urban noise and being disconnected from each other. So we've built highways that separate us. We say that we are now going to be living in new settlements at Tagamo and Sitt October and all of these new things with linking them to highways, which actually makes us spend more time in our cars rather than living life. So this is what we aspire to be. We think that having these highways make us more um, living a more urban lifestyle, but, but this is making us sit in the cars and feel unproductive and very nervous and you shout at each other. Have, I don't know if anyone noticed, but we come, become the f worst version of ourselves when we're driving. Everyone who's around you is actually an, an object that you can hit. Everyone who's driving faster than you is crazy. 
And everyone who's driving slower than you is, a, is, is an idiot. So, <laughs> so I, I, I generally believe that as human beings, we were meant to live a lifestyle away from our cars, where livability is something that is of interest because we are living together, we are doing things together as a human being, and we're connected. So as a building scientist, I became interested in outdoor thermal comfort specifically, understanding what's happening in the space between buildings rather than just what's happening in buildings. So I um, uh, developed with a, uh, a team of my colleagues a tool that assesses outdoor thermal comfort. So if you feel a little bit hot or a little bit cold, this tool would help you map out where in the urban environment in a 2D plane color mesh that would show you where would be places of comfort and not. And so you can help, um, this can help you understand where, for example, you would place Starbucks because this is where everyone would be comfortable and so this people would, would come over there. And so. Uh, in the works at the moment, we're trying to develop apps, basically an app that would tell you if you're going from A to B, you would know if this is going to be a comfortable route or not. And so it would be a decision-making tool that helps you make decisions, as well as a predictive tool that could tell you, well, this is where most people would be going in case they're comfortable. So the future of this idea of sustainable mobility currently is uh, embedded in the idea of sharing economy. and we we are now familiar with Uber, which is a ride-sharing app. Basically, someone in your neighborhood can drive you somewhere, and it's going to be a lot cheaper. But there are also many other things. So for example, in the United States, there is Zipcar. And Zipcar, you can have a card, and you can go and take a car, and it becomes yours for a couple of hours to do something and return it, and it's not yours. You're sharing the car with the community. And there's also bike sharing. So in New York City, there's city bikes. And in, in Boston, there's Hubway. And the idea is you don't own your bicycle. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking if we have bike sharing in Egypt, most probably the bikes are not going to come back, which you are probably right. You are probably right. It's, it's true. So we're, we, we have some, some strides to do before we get to that stage. But the idea is it's going towards the idea of sharing economy, which means that you think about vehicles in a connected way. So there's also the, the technology of connected vehicles where cars would know each other and you would avoid accidents because the cars are intelligently speaking to each other. And so I, I want to move away from that. I think that what's happening in Abu Dhabi and creating um, walking and bicycling plan, which promote that women should be on bicycles and it's okay and it's becoming more healthy and it's the best way to move from one place to the other is the direction to go. So in here I question what is a smart city? Is a smart city a place where you are in your car, you're connected, the cars are talking to each other, or are you in a place where you're on a bicycle and people are talking to each other? So the idea of a smart city is for you to question which future do we want either here or in any cities around. The second field I'm working in is daylighting and energy in buildings. And I am very passionate about daylighting. I think that we have a natural resource here and around the world from the sun. And basically, we can really decrease energy in buildings by relying on the natural resource, which is daylight or sunlight. And so I became uh, involved in many research uh, aspects of daylighting. So. Um, um, I learned simulation tools and I worked with simulation tools to produce images like this. I don't own this image, but it's basically a very realistic image of performance where you can actually measure light and understand in a computer-generated image exactly how light is and how shadows move about. And the worst case scenario when you learn how shadows move about is that you can do this or you can, would know if it's time for a cheeseburger or if, for a Big Mac based on where the shadow lies here. So, yeah. Uh, it, it'll take you a moment, you'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> so I became involved with a group at the American University in Cairo, worked in research about solar screens, which is mashrabeyas for us, basically looking at daylighting and privacy. But with my new position at Syracuse University, I became faculty research fellow at the Syracuse Center of Excellence, which is a great place. It's a center of excellence for the built environment for New York State. And we have um, this test bed, a building that has many technologies in it. For example, green roofs and how they affect thermal performance or natural ventilation or radiative systems in the ceiling. And so my, my desk is right here. 
this is the view from my desk. This, the window is a little bit tinted blue because it's electrochromic glazing. Electrochromic glazing is a smart way for a building to react to solar radiation. If you have too much sun, the window changes its color to allow you to see, to have view, but at the same time, you are not getting all of the solar radiation so you don't feel too hot. And so in this building, the Syracuse Center of Excellence, we test things. We are the guinea pigs. I am a test subject. I'm a someone who's sitting there to be tested. If this is going to make sense to me as a human being or not, that the technologies that are being developed there are tested, this is a part in partnership with Siemens and Sage. And so in this aspect, I intend to lead uh, research about smart building systems, specifically looking at how buildings perform and how we can measure them. The third field is generative design. And I believe we can communicate to the computer and basically have a dialogue as designers and be able to generate spaces that were previously inconceivable unless you use the computer. So in my master's thesis, um, I used what is called genetic algorithms. I borrowed from genetic sciences basically to develop an optimization methodology to develop ceiling forms. So you can imagine in this room we're sitting in right here, if we had access to daylight and you want to generate a space that optimizes for how daylight is, you would communicate that to the computer and it would tell you through simulations and renderings, which is the best form? Is it this ceiling or is that one? And that was basically the subject of my master's um, in Cairo University. And when I moved to MIT, I also worked on urban scale optimization, changing city form or neighborhoods to optimize for access to solar radiation as well as natural ventilation and all of the other aspects. So in my three research fields, I got to collaborate with fantastic entities such as the MIT Energy Initiative, Harvard Graduate School of Design, and Boston Redevelopment Authority. And in this case, I'm presenting this to tell you that we can collaborate together and I'm presenting this opportunity where we can start a dialogue about how building technologies can change our lives, how we can uh, question what is a smart building and what is a smart city. And in the end, I'm, I'm, present, I'm starting a new lab called the Performative Praxis Lab at Syracuse University people. So the idea is people focusing on human beings. And the message I want to leave to you is if we're developing spaces and cities that are smart, should be they be focusing on technologies and vehicles or should be they be focusing on us? This is a picture from the Boston Transportation Department where basically they're developing systems such as smart apps and bicycle interventions as well as public transportation all around this central node which is a human being. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, I have the mic. Can I, can I ask first? Oh, I can't see. I'm sorry. It's, it's OK. Anyway. I have two questions. The first one is um, you develop models of uh, how to measure comfortability and how you build the, the buildings. But did you actually get feedback on how effective this is? So you implemented a test, and then you get people to live there and see how better it performs. And maybe this would answer your question if a smart city is a smart, is a, is a, is a, a city with more smart cars or a city with more, more smart, smart people, people, I'd say. Yeah. The second question okay. is, uh, when you talked about generative uh, buildings and, and daylight, did, do you put in the, the different activity that's being done in such a building and how does it affect your decisions in such a design? So first of all, your question about comfort, and I have one minute and a half, so this will be my, fi my final answer. <laughs> so for, for the question of comfort, I didn't develop the metric. I used the metrics that pre are, were previously developed. So that means that I didn't get the chance to test them out. I'm only mapping performance in terms of what other scientists said that this is going to be comfortable. So I didn't do that yet. So that's question one. And question two, for generative design and optimization and building performance. It is very important to set targets that match what you're looking for. In an office building, you would be very interested in a certain amount of light falling on your desk, when in a gallery, you would be more interested about the uniformity of daylight, which is a different measure. So setting a goal and optimizing for it helps you very much in achieving the goal that you're looking for. I personally developed it for a gallery space in my research, but there are many different aspects. For example, daylighting performance throughout the year rather than one shot in time. So looking at 365 days. And I hope that helped answer your question. And I'm, I ran out of time. So thank you very much and see you around. Yeah.